They found that the least proficient students dramatically overestimated their own ability. The skills they lacked were the same skills required to recognize their incompetence. Is this actually true? No, it isn't. Look at the math. Look at the actual peer-reviewed literature. Look at the math. Nobody's looking at the math. This is just the intro, but like any good intro, if you have a short attention span, it tells you pretty much all you need to know. Back in 2016, first peer-reviewed source was published, and there was a follow-up in 2017. If you take the time to look at the list of the author's names, similar, but not exactly the same group of contributing authors, also based on the same data set. And guess what, guys? This proves that this whole Dunning-Kruger effect nonsense arose as a kind of mirage based on a lack of numeracy. Yeah, that's just like saying a lack of literacy, but with numbers, a fundamental incompetence in interpreting what the meaning of a number is supposed to be. And that comes up when you have this kind of compelling graph made up, a kind of pleasing visual illusion created out of numbers, and people start to forget what those numbers are really supposed to mean. Okay, so it says on screen here, you can read it all yourself, you like, this is a convention of displaying these types of numbers with this type of chart, and here's the problem, starting with the highlighted text on screen, since 1999, assumptions based on interpretations made from that graph's characteristic patterns, exemplified in figure one, which you've just seen, have led to the current consensus view. But we justify this no answer. We justify our contradicting this consensus. We justify this no answer in detail in Appendix A, Part 1, where we address the following six overlooked aspects of numeracy, which is to say, fundamental problems of understanding the meanings of numbers, equivalent to a lack of literacy, a lack of numeracy, this is the problem. These overlooked aspects of numeracy on which such interpretations rest. One, random noise can generate X-shaped patterns in Dunning-Kruger type graphs. And if you don't believe them, guys, they published a whole peer-reviewed article where they do nothing but take random noise and put it through the same process of analysis, and random noise seems to produce the same stunning mathematical relationship because that mathematical relationship is a mirage, an illusion, a hoax, a fraud, whatever you want to say. And researchers can easily misinterpret these patterns as meaningful measures of self-assessment. Two, the Kruger-Dunning type graphs represent patterns that appear meaningful from data sets too small to offer reliability. Three, in Y minus X versus X graphs, sets of X and Y, both bounded by 0 and 100, generate strong ceiling and floor effects that researchers can easily misinterpret as meaningful measures of self-assessment. So guys, if you don't understand what they're saying here, if you're rating yourself a zero, you can't get any lower than zero. If you rate yourself 10 out of 10 or 100 out of 100, you can't get any higher than 100. And that will indeed skew the data or create seemingly meaningful relationships on those charts. Four, sorting data pairs by one member of the pair invariably produces the X-shaped pattern of Kruger-Dunning graphs and sorting data by percentile rank renders all expressions of performance as norm-referenced rather than criterion-based. Five, Kruger-Dunning graphs cannot, repeat, cannot show the distributions of varied self-assessment skills in a populace, so, which is what we're supposed to be studying here, right? That's what we're supposed to be drawing conclusions about. Six, Kruger-Dunning graphs fail to reveal the degree of correlation that exists between self-assessed competence and demonstrated competence on a participant-by-participant -participant basis. Guys, if you want to know more about this, keep watching the video or click on the links below. Read the peer-reviewed articles yourself. Da -da 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 -da. The purpose of this YouTube video is to inform you that the Dunning-Kruger hypothesis is a hoax, is a fraud. Not that it has been debunked by groundbreaking new research, Although the two peer-reviewed articles we work with were published in 2016 and 2017, quotes from them coming up. 
The point is that there never was a basis in the past for people to believe in or propound the Dunning-Kruger hypothesis. Okay? You may object, but the Dunning-Kruger theory that we've all heard quoted on CNN, NBC, BBC, on the radio and newspapers, it's become a kind of middle-class, low-brow meme throughout the pretentious mainstream media. But this theory, it passed peer review, you may say. And yes, and the articles I'm going to quote debunking the theory also passed peer review. And this gets to the problem of fundamental misconceptions about what peer review is and what it means to have the imprimatur of some kind of academic credential, such as a master's degree or a PhD, or to be published in an esteemed peer-reviewed journal. It doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean enough that you should turn off your common sense critical faculties. I knew a researcher who was working with me when I was in Cambodia. We literally worked at different desks in the same office doing social science research. He had a master's degree. Maybe it was sociology, one of the social sciences, I forget which. He was terrible at math. By the way, he couldn't do the math. And this, by the way, the reason why I'm able to say the Dunning-Kruger theory is just debunked, period, not a matter of opinion, is that it, it doesn't come down to a matter of interpretation or feeling or the significance of something being exaggerated. It comes down to the most boring and most ineluctable of, uh, of the sciences, math. The, the dreary, dreadful facts of mathematical computation. And a lot of the research I did in Cambodia came down to sitting around the boardroom table and me having to say, no, 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 the math is wrong. And nobody else at the meeting being competent in doing social science statistics and doing the computations and doing the mathematical element of that kind of research. So, all right, let's part of the back of the story. There was this guy, master's degree. He presented this thesis and then he took the elevator up to his examination. My girlfriend, Melissa, here is off camera. And Melissa, after our last trip to France, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So he gets off the elevator on the right floor and where his thesis examination is supposed to be, there's no room number. And he walks around the hall and each door, there's no number, there's no description of what's inside. This happens all the time in France. All the time. Public buildings, apartment buildings. It's mind-blowing how often in France there is no number on any of the doors. There's no letter, and there isn't a description like atrium or meeting room. You just don't know. You're just supposed to show up and wander around and knock on every door until you find the right door. And people give you directions like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's the brown door, second one on the left, after you come out of the elevator. You're like, the rest of the civilized world does not have this problem. But it's, it's common in France and even within French academia. So, you know, like, yeah, this is important. And he's there. Um, I think he said he was only there five minutes before you know, the examination was supposed to start. It's fine. So, but, you know, he doesn't have a lot of time to kill. So he just says, okay, I've just got to open each door and find out which room this is in. There aren't, obviously, there aren't going to be that many. So he opens the door, empty. Opens the door, empty. Third door he opens. It's the independent thesis examiner. And he's sitting down and for the first time reading his thesis. He's <laughs> doing the job he's paid to do. And he was only on page two. He'd obviously sat down. And, just, and he doesn't look at who's at the door. He just waves over his shoulder and says, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm coming in a minute. I'm just reading. Okay. So this, this is the reality. A lot of authors come on the internet to demystify the creative writing process. I think a lot of filmmakers, a lot of people in Hollywood, uh, whatever, doing fiction, nonfiction, whether it's documentary filmmaking or you know, X-Men, <laughs> Star Wars, people come on to demystify the filmmaking process. I think what we need right now on YouTube is more people with master's degrees and more people with PhDs coming on to demystify the academic credentialing process. Because there, there's, there's a mystique that still endures. And I feel like I'm in the minority of people who've been up close to the process in many different fields for long enough that I really do have a good sense about what it means and what it doesn't mean, even to come out of Cambridge University, even to come out of Oxford University with this kind of credential, right? I can tell horror stories, but it would make this video too long, okay? I've done a lot of social science research. I've seen things go through peer review on all sides. I've been a reviewer. I've been one of the people doing review. I've been the author and of you know other people's research going through. Uh, when I was in Cambodia doing social science research on HIV AIDS that was linked to questions like product, condom use and prostitution, I saw a 100% phony social science statistic published in The Lancet. 
If you guys do not know the name of The Lancet, The Lancet is supposed to represent the highest standard of excellence in the hard medical sciences for peer-reviewed research. And here was The Lancet publishing statistics I knew to be complete BS. <laughs> Here we are, like 10 years later, and that's being published as a peer-reviewed fact in The Lancet. Peer review does not even mean that the claims being published have gone through the level of scrutiny that the New York Times or another major newspaper would apply in the process called fact-checking. It doesn't mean it's been through editorial. Peer review, tragically, does not mean what you think it means, what you want it to mean. So when you hear things like this, like the Dunning-Kruger effect, what, what does it boil down to? If you had a friend who worked in the Department of Motor Vehicles, who interviewed people and tested people before they, they drive a car, let's just say you have a friend who does that job. Every day, 100 people come in and take a driving test. And you ask them, so tell me, do you have any funny stories about someone coming in who thinks they're a great driver, thinks they're really good at driving, and then they're just terrible, they're just awful? You know, the problem is, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I had a funny story. You know, yeah, you know, last year there was one guy like that. You know, just use your common sense. If the Dunning-Kruger thesis were correct, that wouldn't be one funny story once in a long while. It would be like 70% of people. It would be the overwhelming majority of people that the human condition would just be full of people where the overwhelming majority of people think they're really good at driving and then they fail the driving test, Right? And now, of course, if you have a little bit of sympathy, you have a little bit of research uh, experience with social science research of this kind, normally when you go past the surface, why does this particular person greatly overestimate their ability to drive a car? There will be particular reasons, like their eyesight has been getting worse and worse, and they haven't noticed the extent to which their deteriorating eyesight impairs their driving. Like they had a stroke, and they didn't notice the extent to which <laughs> their hand-eye coordination got worse after the stroke, et cetera, et cetera. What sickens me most about the Dunning-Kruger effect is the high-handed way I see it used, mainstream media and here on YouTube, to denigrate everyone's intelligence. Dunning found that the incompetent are often blessed with an inappropriate confidence buoyed by something that feels to them like knowledge. Could the Dunning-Kruger effect explain some of Trump's actions? 97% of climate scientists agree that humans are causing global warming, but Trump appointed someone who denies this to head the Environmental Protection Agency. It's the Dunning-Kruger effect in full force. It affects everyone, from bank robbers to presidents. With any given subject, complete ignorance breeds confidence. And guess what, guys? None of you did the five minutes of research to check a Wikipedia article, to look at the basis and original evidence to understand the mathematics behind it and the mathematics says it's a fraud da -da 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 -da. how much more do you possibly need to know if you're still watching this video i guess you feel like there's more you need to know construction of line charts drawn in the kruger dunning convention does not require directly calculating differences instead these line charts require users to estimate the differences from the distances between the lines in order to interpret the graphs this convention carries the influence of ceiling effects wherein the quantile containing the least competent people overestimate their competency the most simply because they can. Pause. So guys, at the very beginning of this video, we talked about that, what is meant by ceiling and floor effects, and the way this illusion is created just in taking the numbers from raw data and then displaying them in this type of chart, okay? The top quantile represents the most competent participants who, by definition, simply cannot overestimate by as much. Ceiling and floor effects. A strength of this convention is that it can reveal the signal to noise ratio of the measures and allow estimates of the critical size of a data set to generate reproducible results. Histograms. So guys, if you look in the bottom left corner, that's a histogram. Histograms of self-assessment accuracy also employ differences, but in a more constrained way. Unlike broad aggregates of thirds or quartiles, the histogram intervals plural, group only those participants within a narrow range of self-assessment skill. Every interval of a histogram has the same range of percentage points 
the portrayal of all such intervals together as a histogram generates a detailed picture that reduces the influence of the ceiling effect. Now, you'll note the next word in the quotation is however. I am going to keep reading. You're going to hear you're going to hear the warning that follows after the word however. But for ordinary people right now, it's worth taking a moment to just look at this one histogram. Earlier, you heard me say, look, people who do driving tests have a funny story once in a while about someone who greatly overestimates their competence at driving a car. They have a funny story once in a while and someone who greatly underestimates their ability, okay? But if you look at this chart, you're talking about maybe 1% of people at one extreme end and 1% at the other. If you just break it down and look at it in a reasonable way, it does not remotely support what the, the term Dunning-Kruger effect has come to mean. I, I just played you guys a clip from a really smarmy YouTube video, really self-important YouTube video with a British accent, suggesting you that the Dunning-Kruger effect just warps our whole society, from bank robbers to the President of the United States. This is this massive pervasive effect in our society. And guys, just even looking at this one chart for a minute, you have to realize that isn't so. That really, most people, most of the time, really do have a reasonable ability to assess their own competence or incompetence. And if you just have kind of reasonable range of things, the vast majority of people, they're not going to be wildly inaccurate. Maybe they expected to do a bit better on the chemistry test than they did, and maybe they expect to do a bit worse. But we are not living in the fictional parallel universe described by the mainstream media's misinterpretation of the Dunning-Kruger hypothesis, a hypothesis that is now debunked and exposed as a fraud. Sometimes the comparison of one chart to another is powerful enough to show you the nature of the problem, but it doesn't really show you the solution. And that is the warning that follows after the word however. I promised you before that I'd keep reading from the word however because it's a caveat tacked on to the point already made. However, Histograms introduce a second illusory pattern wherein more participants may appear to have good self-assessment skills than is the case. This illusion occurs because the random noise present in imperfect measures of self-assessment imparts a strong probability towards producing a normal distribution centered to the value of perfect self-assessment. Okay, so if you look at the two histograms on the left-hand side of the page, one of them is just taking random numbers and putting them through the same process of analysis and displaying them as a chart, and the other one is not random. The other one is real data, data you've already seen displayed on screen. They resemble each other enough that we have to be aware of a source of skew here, All right? So we're just being consistent. Looking at the contrast between these histograms and the type of conclusion drawn by Dunning-Kruger and all the people influenced by Dunning-Kruger, not just in the mainstream media, but throughout the social sciences, anthropology, sociology, throughout all the halls of academia, the contrast is powerful enough to show us the problem. However, this isn't a case where we can solve the problem by just replacing one type of graph with another. Histogram is better, but it is still in its own way flawed and misleading. It's never fun to come to the part of the report where they have to make the leap from numbers to adjectives. Like, how do you define overconfident, underconfident, how do you find stupid? <laughs> you know, they don't want to use loaded adjectives. They have to come up with a spectrum of values and then somehow pin them to the numbers. This is inevitably going to be imperfect and a little bit misleading. But the point here is this is radically, fundamentally incompatible with the Dunning Kruger hypothesis, both like a strict reading of what Dunning and Kruger actually said and argued. And it's even more incompatible with the pop culture phenomenon that the popularization of Dunning-Kruger has entailed. Maybe you're looking at 5.5% of people at one extreme of the chart, and maybe you're looking at 5.3% at the other extreme. This is not, not the fictional parallel universe described by Dunning-Kruger. It's not. So there's a minority at either end who are doing a poor job of assessing their own competence. But let's keep in mind, what is it that they're assessing their competence in? On the right-hand side of the screen, there's a quotation from the earlier 2016 article. This was a test of science literacy, okay? The science literacy concept inventory test, a 25-item survey 
of how much you know about science. So any reasonable person, you know, has to point out even here, if you ask someone, how confident are you in how much, how, in your own level of science literacy? And then you test them and you find out how, how literate they are or how illiterate they are by this peculiar test, the test I haven't seen, by the way. That's not going to tell you anything about how this applies to real world situations like the President of the United States or people taking driving exams or asking someone, hey, do you, do you think you're any good at drawing? Do you think you're good at, at sketching a picture or making a painting? And then ask them to actually draw or sketch something and maybe they do poorly or maybe they do much better than they thought. This is not going to have broad applicability even across the social sciences, let alone in life, the way the Dunning-Kruger hypothesis has now been applied to all aspects of human life. Summarizing the conclusions to the 2017 study, rather than reading every single word of it, look, the original hypothesis of Dunning-Kruger was A, that people's self-assessed competence is really significantly biased and specifically that people overestimate their ability, people overestimate their competence, and in pop culture that's been interpreted as meaning that the vast majority of people overestimate their intelligence. All right? Further, that it's the stupid people, that it's the low proficiency performers, as stated here, who are the most prone to egregious overestimations. And both of these have been disproven in these studies. Further, the specific mathematical basis for the fiction has been demonstrated and exploded, if you like. Starting way down at the bottom of the page here, what do we find? In much of the peer-reviewed self-assessment literature, we believe we have found key weaknesses in the numeracy employed during nearly two decades of collecting, presenting, and interpreting self-assessment data because of insufficient attention to numeracy. Basic lack of competence, not understanding what the numbers mean, a word that is parallel to illiteracy, innumeracy. <laughs> Current prevalent explanations of the nature of human self-assessment seem to rest on a tenuous foundation. There are a lot of conclusions worth drawing here, guys. There's a really grave, really serious warning about the nature of peer-reviewed <laughs> academic generation of knowledge. <laughs> There's a really grave warning about the way that type of knowledge gets popularized in the mainstream media. And it's also significant that uh, these studies try to draw our attention to the fact that self-assessment people's feeling about their own competence or incompetence, it is meaningful. It is worth studying. It's even something worth practicing and worth teaching. And these studies suggest that one reason why academia has not been interested in hearing assessments and evaluation of higher education from students is precisely that it is inconvenient for those who are making millions of dollars running universities in the way that they are. That is, again, a very interesting suggestion. Maybe one of the important ways for improving higher education is, shall we say, not just listening to the doctors in the hospital, but also the patients, paying more attention to what students are saying is working and not working, what students say actually helps them learn, and what does not. Da -da 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 -da.